All right, so let's see. I'm actually gonna reduce the size of this for a second. So we are in week of September 28th through August or October 1st. We have nervous system that we're covering this week. Your exam will be at the end of the week and it's over uh, chapters four through six and you'll need to use an uh, honor lock for that. So um, just wanna make sure that you knew. All right, let's go back to, it, it moved me back, all right. Nope. Okay, so reflex arc. So the cool thing about a reflex arc is that the signals don't have to go to the brain. Okay, so that's the reason why you're able to have a reflex of, you know, you, you know, the classic one is the doctor hits your knee and your leg kicks out, um, but very fast reaction to some stimulus, right? So what ends up happening, it's like if you touch something or you get a pin, it touches your skin and it hurts. Your sensory receptors in your skin send a signal to the axons and your sensory neurons that will feed back into your dorsal root ganglion. Okay, and that will also then signal into your dorsal horn of your spinal cord. Okay, then you'll have a signal that will go to a, from a sensory neuron to an interneuron. Then that inner neuron does some processing, okay, and then sends a signal to a motor neuron, okay, and then that motor neuron sends a signal to some part of the body, in this case, muscle tissue, okay, and goes through the ventral root, okay. So, again, this signal is very fast because it doesn't have to go up to the brain and back, okay. So that's what makes it a much faster reaction. All right, let's talk a little bit about the brain. So your brain's made up of some basic parts. You can get a lot more specific, but this is a good overview. So you've got your cerebrum, large part of your brain. Okay, you have the diencephalon. Okay, and that diencephalon is composed of your hypothalamus, your thalamus, and your pineal gland. Okay, you also have a brain stem, which is composed of your midbrain, your pons, and your medulla oblongata. All right, so uh, I don't know if you ever watched The Water Boy, you know, there's a big joke about the medulla oblongata, um, but if you watch it, you won't forget it, right? So um, then you have the uh, cerebellum and the central canal and the ventricles. We talked briefly about the ventricles last time, right? But remember the, we had the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. All right, here's another view. You have a big view of the cerebrum. And you can see that the lateral ventricle, third ventricle, pineal gland, cerebellum. All right, you got your diencephalon, your brain stem, okay, midbrain, over here, your pons, medulla oblongata. Okay, one thing I will tell you is look at the, if you look at this sagittal section of the uh, cerebellum, to me it looks kind of like a, a tree with you know its branches and the leaves. And uh, so, you know, if you see that, no, that's the cerebellum. All right, start with the cerebrum. That's the biggest part of your brain, right? So its job is to receive sensory information. And it carries out a process called integration, okay, where it's processing the information that it receives, okay? 
And then it's going to initiate some voluntary motor responses. Also coordinates activities in other parts of the brain. So the cerebrum also influences the other parts of the brain. And it's involved in higher thought processes. So you know, your re reflux is a simple um, process. And so in some sense, it's great because it's fast. In the other sense, it's great is it, it sort of protects the brain for the functions that it really needs, right? So it's not, you're not taxing the brain on things that it doesn't really need to be concerned with, right? So the structure of the cerebrum, you divide it in half on sagittal, Okay, if you just make like a sagittal cut, you get cerebral hemispheres. And what we call the longitudinal fixture or, or fissure will divide the cerebrum into left and right hemispheres. Okay. And it's connected on the inside of your brain by a structure called the corpus callosum. So it's also made up of gyri and sulci. So if you see all the little ridges and grooves, the ridges where it goes up, those are gyri. And then the grooves are the sulci. Okay, gyrus is singular, sulcus is singular. Okay. All right, so we typically think of the brain as kind of being right brain and left brain. It's a little more complicated than that, but you know, because we tend to use both sides of our brain, um, but we tend to think in terms of you know, the more creative side of our brain as being the left brain, and then the more logical side as more the right brain, um, and given in if you're looking at this, you're really looking at this like you're looking at the patient. So um, you got to kind of remember left is right and right is left, right? Okay, just a little comparison. If you look at the size of the brain, and particularly the cerebrum. Okay, so compared to, you know, this, a elephant or a dolphin, you know, our brains are around, you know, similar size. Um, but if you look at dog, cat, mouse, obviously we have much larger brains, right? So, um, but if you think about an elephant, you know, it has a somewhat larger brain, right? But it's a much larger animal, right? So in proportion, its brain isn't that large, okay? All right. Okay, show you here some differences from the embryonic standpoint. So from the vertebrate brain, and you can see early cerebrum, thalamus, and optic lobe, cerebellum, and medulla. Compare that to a shark brain where you just basically have cerebrum, cerebellum. Okay. Goose brain, cerebrum, cerebellum. So not as complicated. All right. And then it just kind of shows you what those developmental structures develop into. All right, so structure of the cerebrum made up of some different lobes. So you'll learn a lot about these in the lab, but if you notice, since we've covered skeletal system and muscular system already, you should see some familiar names on this page. Okay, so in the anterior portion of the brain, you've got the frontal lobe, okay. 
the upper part of the brain, you got the parietal lobe. Side of the brain, you got the temporal lobe. Posterior or uh, posterior portion of the brain, you have the occipital lobe. All right, so frontal lobe. It's where most of your thinking, planning, organizing, problem solving happens. Your emotions, behavior, personality is also controlled there. Motor cortex, uh, as the name suggests, helps you with motion. Sensory cortex helps you with sensing things, okay? You know, whether it's pain or you know, other touch, pressure. Parietal lobe helps you with arithmetic, spelling, making sense of what's going on in the world. Occipital lobe, okay, helps you with vision, okay? So that your optic nerve, as we'll learn later, sends signals to the occipital lobe. Okay, it allows you to process what you see through your eyes. Temporal lobe helps you with memory. So as you're trying to remember everything in this class, right, you're taxing your temporal lobes, right? So your understanding as you're trying to process what you're reading and listening and you know watching, trying to understand it using your temporal lobe, right? So a lot of, so you're actually, when you're studying for this class, if you think about it, obviously you have to look at things. So you're using your occipital lobe, right? Processing what you see. Uh, you're thinking, planning, problem solving. So you're using your frontal lobe, okay? All right, so you're, you may have some math. You may be having to do spelling, right? Having to write these words out, um, trying to make sense of it all. You might be using some parietal lobe uh, as you're trying to learn and commit it to memory as you're in a sense there's so many terms in amp it's like learning another language you're using your temporal lobe right so you're actually using a lot of your brain right to study for this class what is the term for pride <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good yeah dysfunctional but uh I think it's, she said dysfunctional. <laughs> well, it, you know, like anything else, this is a process of it's, I mean, your brain's not a muscle, but you're, you're strengthening it. And, and there are gonna be times when your muscle feels fatigued, right? So, uh, but it's a process of building endurance in your brain. So, um, you know, if you go from not having to learn a lot of terms to learning a lot of terms, it's gonna be hard. Um, this is basic training. So I don't, I don't come into this class expecting you to know everything. If I did, you wouldn't need to be here. Okay. This is for you to learn how to do well in this field. Now, some of you are already in the field and that's good. Um, but this is to help you because when you get into the more advanced courses in your program, they're going to want you to have a foundation already. They're not going to want to be reteaching you a lot of this stuff. Okay. So, and a lot of what you're going to be doing is more application based, more hands on. Uh, so, it'll probably make a lot more sense when you get there. Uh, but again, you have to have a foundation. Okay. So, um, you know, if you were in the military, they wouldn't just, you just sign your name on the dotted line and they just send you to war the next day. You know, they have to teach you how to march and they got to teach you how to. You know, shoot weapons and you know whatever top job they give you in the military, you got to learn how to do that, right? So because you know what they do is really important, and if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna mess it up. You know, same with healthcare. If they just you know say, okay, you want to be a nurse? Okay, go go practice on some people. And you're like, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work like that. You know, so there's a lot of things you got to do to get ready. So uh, world's not built in a day and uh, you're not going to learn AMP in one day. So, um, newsflash, you're going to be learning your whole life. So, those of us who are a little older know that you're still learning, right? So, it's not a uh, thing that you finish your program and you're done. You're going to have to do professional development, stay up on what's going on in your field. Um, so, it's going to be okay. Thank you. You're welcome.
So lobes of cerebral hemisphere. Okay, so this sort of gives you an idea of some of the things that your brain does where your brain is doing the processing. And so they do, you know, they're neuroscientists, neurologists, neurosurgeons who do, you know, not so much anymore, but have done experiments, you know, where the part of the brain is exposed and they'll touch different parts of the brain and, see, and ask questions and see uh, what people are able to do when certain parts of the brain are stimulated. Uh, and they're also able to ask questions and they can look on a, on a MRI or some other CT scan and they can see what's going on when, when patients are doing certain things. And so they've been able to figure out, you know, the frontal lobe, what's the primary motor area, okay? And the premotor area where speech is happening, Broca's area. Okay, uh, in terms of motor, air, motor function, they found that the leg, you're processing things here, trunk, here, arm, hand, face, and tongue. Okay. Now for smell, they have found that a lot of your smelling is processed here. For auditory, the things you hear, okay, a lot of it is here, and that should make sense. Okay, this near where your ear canal is, right? Okay, you have a sensory speech area called Wernicke's area here. Okay. So if you think about it, you're probably processing what you're hearing in speech there, but as far as being able to talk, you need to be able to activate the motor area because you're moving the muscles in your mouth, right? So the parietal, you have a lot of sensory information being processed there, taste being processed here, and you have more of a general interpretation area in this specific area here. Visual, as I said, processing the occipital lobe. So just kind of helps you to visualize where in the brain some of these things are happening. And one thing I, I will tell you right here, I didn't mention this sulcus right there, we call that central sulcus. Okay, it's kind of a major area of separation. Okay, so I just want to make sure you're aware of that. And this one here, we call the lateral sulcus. All right, so there's the insula. So in the insula, it's deep to the lateral sulcus. Okay. And so there, you're processing things like speech, taste, emotions. Okay. We call that the insula, part of your cerebrum. All right. So from a different perspective, the outer layer, the gray matter in your cerebrum, we call that cerebral cortex, like a crown around it. Okay. So you get sensation, voluntary movement, consciousness in this area. All right. So another kind of view of motor and sensory areas in cerebral cortex. So this is your. You have the primary motor area, okay, right up here. Oh, actually, right here is primary in blue. That's your primary motor cortex, okay, on one side of the central sulcus. So it's anterior to the central sulcus, to, toward the front of the head, or front of the body. In each hemisphere, controls voluntary commands to the skeletal muscle on the opposite side of the body. So there's actually a place where you're in your brain, where the nerves innervate your brain, there's kind of a crisscross point, okay? So if you're interpreting things on, on one side of your brain, you're actually sort of controlling things that happen on the opposite side of your body. All right.
right. And the area of the cortex is, has some relationship to the size of those motor units. Okay. So you can see, generally speaking, so you have the here on the troop, on that primary motor area, you're controlling the foot, the hip, the, the trunk, the arm, the hand, face, tongue, and larynx. Okay. Now, if you think about it, you're going from essentially the bottom of the body here, curving around, going to the top of the body. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's the, the, the movements that go on in your facial muscles are very uh, detailed. Right. So it's, you know, like you said, you know, moving your, your bicep, you know, it's, it's, it's not that it's not important. It's just that it's fairly simple contraction compared to what you would have with your orbicular sorus. Exactly. All right, so motor or sensory areas. Now we just talked about the primary motor area, then we have this primary somatosensory area. So it's posterior to the central sulcus and it's in the parietal lobe. So it's kind of behind or posterior to that primary motor area. And each hemisphere is going to receive sensory information from the skin and skeletal muscles on the opposite sides. And the cortex area, again, is related to the number of receptors in an area. So this, while it's not exactly the same as the picture that we just saw, uh, is very similar in that what are the parts of the body where they have to be extremely sensitive to touch or pressure? Hand, foot, mouth and tongue, right? Lips and tongue. So you have a lot more receptors in those areas. All right, so you have, again, another way of looking at it. So again, this is the primary motor area. Okay, foot. Leg, thigh, pelvis, arm, forearm, hand. Okay, lots of area devoted to that. Lots devoted to the face. Okay, facial expression, salivation. Okay, vocalization, making sound, chewing, mastication, uh, swallowing. So lots of space devoted to that. All right, also on the primary somatosensory area, Okay, so you have general region, foot and toes, the leg, thigh, the pelvis, trunk, the neck, the arm, forearm, large area for the hand, fingers and thumb, large area for the upper face, large area for the lips, large area for the teeth and gums, large area for the tongue and pharynx. But in both cases, it can sound like you start with the feet sort of in the middle and then curving out toward the sides of the brain to get to the face. So other areas in the cerebral cortex include the primary taste area. It's located in the insula. We just looked at that as well as the parietal lobes. Obviously it's involved in sensing taste. So the primary visual area, it's located in the occipital lobe, right? You get information from our eyes. 
The primary auditory area, makes sense, located in the temporal lobe and where the eardrum is, or the closest to the eardrum. So uh, you're getting information from your inner ears. All right, so it's another view, kind of what we've already seen, right? So you can get a sense for a lot of the areas that we've just covered. All right, we also have association areas. So we have essentially areas where your body receives information or areas where your body sends information from. You also have areas where your body's integrating, processing. So where memories get stored. Also, it's gonna be very close to the primary area for that activity. All right, so again, your primary motor area is here. Association area is there, not far away. A little more anterior. All right, so for auditory, primary is here, associated area is here. Touch, here's the primary area, the associated area. Visual, primary area, associated area. Higher order, or you know, higher order thinking goes on there and up here in the frontal lobe. So at these processing centers, all that information from those association centers gets processed and you have higher level analytical processing. So one of those areas is the prefrontal area where you get reasoning and planning and the premotor area where you're organizing your motor function so you can have a very skilled movement. Okay, I also have a processing center at the a speech area called Broca's area. Again, his speech is a very complicated muscle and you know just a very complicated muscle movement and other parts of your body that are involved in making sound. Okay, you also have a general interpretive area called Wernicke's area and it's for processing written and spoken messages. So we just talked about these, but you got the picture here. So again, there's the Broca's area for speech, premotor for writing, motor for writing. So remember, so to the primary associated, and then here's your processing center. You have a motor speech area and Wernicke's area. All right, just another view. There's that central sulcus, there's your motor area and your somato sensory area, there's your auditory area, visual. Okay. All right, and it shows this person, I guess they're trying to interpret kind of things that are going on in the brain. Uh, yeah, I guess that's one way that you could do it. Um, but uh, fortunately, um, not a common practice. Uh, you know, there are certain situations where it might be necessary, but uh, not, I think it was not something that, that happens often, fortunately. So. All right, so differences. If you're an extrovert, who here thinks they're an extrovert? Anybody? Okay. All right, got a few. I think there are a few more. I think people are just tired and they're not raising their hands. Um, and so stimuli is gonna run through an area where taste, touch, visual, and auditory sensory processing takes place. Okay, so they have a very short pathway for their dopamine. Remember dopamine kind of gives you pleasure. All right, um, introverts, your stimuli is going to go through a long, complicated pathway. Areas of your brain, your brain associated with remembering, planning, solving problems. 
So rather, it's sort of a complicated way of saying, you know, or extroverts sometimes are in the moment and, you know, they're having a good time. The introverts are kind of processing, seeing is this kind of place where I want to be involved? Do I want to talk to these people? Do I feel comfortable? Because their brain's processing, right? Rather than just getting straight to the dopamine, right? So just one way of thinking about it. All right, so we'll stop there. I want you to talk about the different parts of the brain and what they do with your partner. You can do that at home as well. Let's talk about, the, we just talked about the gray matter, right, in the cerebral cortex. So now let's talk about the white matter. Okay, so these different, there's tracks in it and they communicate information between these different sensory and motor and association areas that we just learned about. Okay, so these tracks can communicate with other parts of the brain. And so you can see these lines, they go to different parts of the brain. All right, so in the spinal cord, tracks also communicate with one another. You have what's known as descending tracks, and they come from the primary motor area, okay? When they're descending, why? Because they're sending a motor signal to your body, right? From the brain. And you have ascending tracks, and they're gonna go to the primary somatosensory area in your brain. So they're ascending up your spinal cord. Okay, so the blue areas, that's your ascending tracks. The red areas, those are your descending tracks. All right, let's talk a little bit about the corpus callosum, okay? So in this picture, you know, the corpus callosum is sort of depicted as the great mediator, right? Because we talk about the two cerebral hemispheres is kind of processing information, but maybe you're more left-brained or right-brained, uh, but you've got to have a way for those hemispheres to communicate with each other. And right, and also remember we said that what's going on in one part of the body is controlled by the other side of the brain. Remember that? So corpus callosum is part of that process, okay? But it joins the two cerebral hemispheres together. Okay, basal nuclei. These are just masses of gray matter and they're deep inside the cerebrum. Okay, and these will integrate or process motor commands. So commands to do something. So in the case of Huntington's disease or Parkinson's disease, you get uncontrollable movements, right? And it's believed to have something to do with the neurotransmitters. If you remember from the last couple of classes, we talked about acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters that send signals across the synapse, right? So if you have these neurotransmitter imbalances in the basal nuclei, they can, and they can basically mess up these motor commands, right? So you get uncontrollable movements. So, and I know probably our most famous person with Parkinson's disease, it's a certain version of it, but um, you know, Michael J. Fox and y'all may, most of you may probably go, well, who is that? But uh, when I was growing up, you know, there's family ties and he was a big star on that show and did Back to the Future, um, but you know, has a severe specific case of it at this point in his life. All right, let's talk about the diencephalon. So with the diencephalon, one part of it is the hypothalamus. And it forms the floor or the base of the third ventricle. Okay, remember the third ventricle? So 
Some of that was involved in moving and storing cerebral spinal fluid. The hypothalamus serves as an integrating center or processing center involved in homeostasis. Oh, what's homeostasis? Anybody remember? Balance, right? So keeping things in a certain range regulates things like sleep, temperature, hunger, thirst, water balance. It serves as a connection point between your endocrine system and your nervous system. So how does it do that? Well, your endocrine system is involved in producing and secreting hormones, right? So the hypothalamus will produce hormones that are produced by the posterior pituitary gland. So it makes those hormones. And it'll also secrete hormones that control the anterior pituitary gland. Okay, so it's controlling the production and secretion of hormones. Okay. All right, we also have the thalamus in the dinencephalon. And it's located in the sides and roof of the third ventricle. What does it do? Well, it serves as a sensory relay center for all the sensory input except for the smell. And it's involved in arousal of the cerebrum. Okay. And it's involved in emotions and your memory. So another part of the brain that you're activating and studying for this class. Another part of the diencephalon is the pineal gland. It regulates daily rhythms in the body through hormone melatonin. Okay. So, you know, some people take melatonin, help them sleep, uh, regulate circadian rhythms, okay? So it's, you know, helpful because most people either they go to bed, they get up at the same time each day generally. Um, but people who have trouble with that, uh, sometimes it could be an issue with melatonin. So it could be that you are having difficulty producing enough of it. It could also be that you have something in your life that is um, either degrading your melatonin or keep, you know, um, blocking it in terms of maybe there's a receptor that's being blocked. Um, but a lot of times, I would say in, in a lot of cases, it could be stress. Um, it could be you're working a schedule that you know, maybe some days you work nights, some days you work days, and that makes it really difficult to be on a traditional sleep cycle. And so when you do have an opportunity to go to sleep, it's difficult. Um, and all those things can sort of mess with your circadian rhythms. So uh, jet lag, so people, you know, obviously right now, people aren't doing a whole lot of traveling, but you know, if you've ever gone on a long trip um, and the time zones are different, um, it's very difficult to sleep for the first day or so. And then when you come back, it's difficult to adjust back to the time zone. Um, also people that live in places like Alaska, um, in Alaska they get six months of daylight and six months of, day, of nighttime, okay, based on where they are in relation to the sun. Um, and so, you know, trying to sleep when it's right outside, it, one o'clock in the morning, you know, might be a little difficult. So uh, trying to get up when it's dark outside is sometimes difficult. So. 
people who work the night shift. Yes. They have that difficulty. Right. Like I know like I have a family member who works night shift at a plant and you know they, they have to have um, like blackout curtains. Um, because you know they're at home during the day, that's when they get to sleep. So, you know, they gotta make sure there's no light, you know, because it's it just prevents them from going to sleep. All right, so we just covered the cerebrum, right? And the diencephalon, All right? So let's go ahead and pause and talk about what you learned about the diencephalon. Okay, so I had a question here about what would happen if you had an injury to the brain. And basically my response was it really depends on where the injury was. And if you look at the areas and what they do, if I were to ask you on a test, hey, they had an injury to this area, what would the corresponding problem be would be to you know what that area does. Okay, so think about it in that way too, in terms of healthcare application. We're going to go back to where we were. All right, limbic system. So with the limbic system is inferior or below the cerebral cortex. And it's going to have neural pathways in it. And it connects parts of your cerebral cortex and your temporal lobes with your thalamus and your hypothalamus. And it is very involved in your emotions. Okay. So if you are quote unquote in your feelings, you are in your limbic system, right? Um, so hopefully that helps you remember it, right? So, uh, it's involved in also in memory and learning, right? And because also sometimes how you feel is involved in what you remember, right? So anybody have times when they were really, really happy or really, really sad and that memory is just really crystal clear. You can remember it like it was yesterday. So that's why. So your hippocampus, helps you take short-term memory and convert to long-term memory. So this is a part of your brain you really, really want to use in this class, right? So if you're thinking about, well, how do I integrate the psychology of how the brain works to learning in this class, if you're going to be successful in this class or you're going to be successful in this field, you got to be able to take things and apply them to your long-term memory, right? So this may or may not be the most fun thing in this class or, or most thing in your life. It may not be fun. You got to figure out how to make this fun. So, you know, whether it's turning it into a game, talking with friends about it, whatever that is, um, you know, looking at medical shows and then going, hey, what did I learn in class and how does it relate to this? Um, because if, if you make it fun you make it, if you have some emotion that you connect with what you're learning you're going to remember it right so but if it's just okay here's another chapter and i gotta read this and i gotta turn in this assignment you know you'll remember it for a day or two and then, or you might hopefully you might remember it for a test you know if you do and then after that what happens you forgot it right so um you know really try to figure out how to laugh more, you know, do more things that are fun uh, while you're studying, uh, because um, you know there's a lot of funny anatomy videos on the internet. You know, they, they make you laugh; they'll help you remember it. Um, so, you know, just apply this. You know, so it's not just information for you to re just regurgitate. Um, this stuff is, I mean, they, they've researched this and they know this is how it works. And so this is a class where you got to remember a lot. So you might as well take advantage of the information and, and apply it, right? So. Okay, you said my 
<laughs> yeah. Sure. So there's parts of that that have to do with how your brain's developing, and also in terms of the development of your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is not as developed when you're little as when you are older. Uh, so your ability to convert it to long-term memory is tougher. Um, and so that that's part of it. Uh, yeah. Okay, I can't stop thinking about her core memory. Yes. I mean, hey, you know, that, that whole thing with Bing Bong, you know, that just, that, that, yeah, that was, I mean, hey, you know, that's real. I mean, you don't. Right. No, I mean, I can't remember. I can probably remember four or five years old. And then, you know, before that, I don't remember any of it. So, um, but yeah, that's a, you know, Sorry, I went with the inside out reference. Those of you are like, what did he say? Um, it's a character in the story. His character's name is Bing Bong. And uh, she forgets about it. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a Disney movie called Inside Out. It has to do with the emotions. Um, and so it does have to do with the limbic system, right? Uh, also deals with memory. So it, it's, a, it's a kid's movie or a family movie, but there, it, it, it relates a little bit. So if you want to watch it and think about what you're learning, you know, maybe that'll help you remember it. <laughs> All right. So, so when you have young children, that's what you watch. So you know, that's why I know about that kind of stuff. So. All right. Deja vu. Anybody heard the term deja vu? All right. So French term literally means already seen. So your brain is constantly trying to create these whole perceptions of the world with very limited input because we don't know everything, right? Um, the theory here is you get some delay in routing short-term memory to long-term memory and then accessing it and you feel like it's happened before okay so you know it's possible you have been there before or have experienced something before it's also possible you experienced something similar you know so but it could be just your brain and trying to process information okay but you're also we tend to, our brains tend to process information in ways that make us feel comfortable and make us feel like, because our, our brains don't like to be in situations where we're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't know. And so we tend to sort of say, oh, well, that's like this. And it may or may not be. Um, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, you can have, you know, someone who commits a crime and they'll ask 10 people who were there, you know, what does this person look like and, you know, everything. And then, you know, they'll find out, well, who is the actual person? And it looks nothing like what these 10 people said, right? Because our brains are processing and doing the best they can in the moment to try to remember everything. But we sometimes don't remember everything as well as we think we do, so. So, or the classic, you know, hey, I, you know, I used to walk in the snow 10 miles a day to go to school and it, you really didn't walk 10 miles a day, but you know, in your brain, you remember it was, it was 10 miles or, you know, I had, I was trying to catch this fish and it was, you know, it was a 10 pounder, you know, it was a perch, but you, in your brain, you remember it was 10 pounds, you know? So, um, so, We've talked about the cerebrum in great detail. Let's talk a little bit about the cerebellum. All right, so here you got two hemispheres made up. Even in the cerebellum, you have two hemispheres. 
and you get this internal white matter and it looks like a tree, right? To me, it looks like a tree, okay, sideways. And here you're receiving sensory input from your eyes, your ears, your joints, and your muscles. Okay, so you're processing sensory input, or you're receiving it anyway. So you're also receiving motor output from the cerebral cortex. So essentially, sensory information is traveling to the cerebellum. Motor output is traveling from the brain through the cerebellum down to the rest of the body. Helps you with things like posture, right? Helps you stand up straight, okay? Uh, balance. Helps you to have smooth, coordinated movements, right? So you're not jerky and, you know, uh, makes your movement more fluid. So assists in learning of new motor skills, okay? So, you know, I think that there's probably some cerebellum involved in, you know, dance and, you know, uh, sports, things like that, help you with coordinated movements. Um, you know, so folks that may struggle, you know, may, you know, obviously there are things you can learn, but obviously some people may be better at certain types of dance than others. Uh, so there may be some smooth and voluntary movements that they're able to do. Okay, brain stem. You got your midbrain. Serves as a relay station. Between your cerebrum and the spinal cord or between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And you have reflex centers for visual, auditory, and tactile responses. Tactile has to do with touch. And so if you can see on the picture, it's like if you were to remove the cerebellum so you could see the uh, midbrain. So here's your thalamus, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, spinal cord. And the pons, so here you have bundles of axons and they go between the cerebellum and the rest of your central nervous system. And it helps regulate your breathing rate. Along with your medulla oblongata. And you have reflex center here as well. But the ones here are for movements of your head in response to visual an auditory stimuli. Okay. So if you're you hear a sudden sound, turn your head in, using your pawns. Yes. So is it true that the medulla oblongata doesn't have any pain receptors? Uh yeah, I would say that that's, that's fairly true. Um it's you know it has a more, little different function. Um you know, you're probably going to, if you have some issues with it, you're probably going to have, uh, probably going to get pain other other places, maybe not there specifically. So, good question. What is it, what is its role in the medulla oblongata? So, it helps you with heart rate, respiration, blood pressure. So, a lot of our more involuntary things, right? Also has some reflex centers involved for things like vomiting, sneezing, hiccuping, coughing, and swallowing. Okay. So if you have issues with your medulla oblongata, I mean that can be really bad because those are a lot of important functions. Fortunately, we don't have to think to do them, but if our brains have problems doing it or our brainstem has a problem doing it, you're gonna have a hard time.
All right, the reticular formation. So the tracts as well as the nuclei are connected to lots of other areas in the brain. So it's also involved with respiration, heart, heart rate and blood pressure, along with the medulla oblongata as well as your pons. So along with the thalamus, helps you kind of rouse or awaken someone who's asleep. Okay. Keeps you mentally alert, helps you process sensory stimuli. And if it becomes damaged, the person could go into a coma. So you can see here the reticular formation, information from it can go to several parts of the brain. Okay. So again, just kind of going back to this picture, we covered the cerebrum, the ventricles, the diencephalon, the brain stem. Okay, we've also covered cerebellum a little bit as well. All right. So we are going to, I think, pause here and talk about nervous system differences by gender next time. Okay. So do you like they do on the TV show? Maybe you have to tune in for the next episode, right? So um, let's go ahead and do our exit tickets. Okay.